Hey, this is Christians Wake Up. And today we're going to be talking about Simon Magus. Simon Magus. Now, you might not know who Simon Magus is, but you will probably know who Simon is because Simon is mentioned in the New Testament as someone who um, was trying to buy a gift, and that was the Holy Spirit. But we want to talk about Simon Magus, and there's a reason why we're going over um, some of the things that he did, because it's going to play into this lesson on Peter and Paul. But there's some things significant about Simon Magus that we want to look at. And Simon Magus was um, a person that who, uh, I don't know how, how should I say it? He was misrepresenting Peter and he was also an enemy of Peter. So, you know, Peter's, Peter had his doctrine, which was according to Hamashiach and the person, Simon Magus, was twisting it to make it his own. But we want to hear this account from the mouth of Peter. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Clementine of Homilies, page or chapter two. And in the PDF version, it's page uh, 365. But let's go there right now. This section is called Misrepresentation of Peter's Doctrine. Let's just read what it says. It says, in order, therefore, that the like may also happen to those among us as to the 70. Give the books of my preachings to our brethren. Now, just to let you know, and I'm just pausing right here. Peter has more than two books. So in the King James uh, Bible, we have first and second Peter. And they make it as though he never wrote anything else, that he did no other ministry except for those two books that are in the King James Bible because they dwindled it down. But he he was in the Clementine of Homilies. He was in the uh, Pseudopicrypha, or excuse me, actually the Nag Hammadi, as well as the Lost Scriptures. So there are way more books, and there are books that we haven't even recovered or don't even know about that Peter wrote. That was only to the brethren, just like it says right here, give the books of my preachings to our brethren with the like mystery of initiation that they may indoctrinate those who wish to take part in teaching. So we know that he had more than just the two books uh, that's in the Bible, because those books are for the mass public. It's, it was a public, but there were books that were only for the brethren and you had to go through this initiation in order to get access to Peter's writings. So once again, uh, that they may indoctrinate those who wish to take part in teaching. For if it be not so done, our word of truth will be rent into many opinions. This is where we're getting to about Simon Magus and Apostle Paul, those who say Apostle Paul, it says, and this I know not as being a prophet, but as already seeing the beginning of this very evil. So he saw this evil that was happening right during that time. He didn't need a prophet to um, prophesy this. He saw it happening. It says for some from among the Gentiles have rejected my legal preaching. Now, this just made me think of something. I wasn't going to even go here. It says, for some among the Gentiles have rejected my legal preaching. Who was, who was Peter sent to? Ah, let's, let's go to what Peter said that the Savior said he was sent to. Let's do this. I'm going off the script right now. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, let me see. Might be able to find it like this. Right here. Acts 15, verse 7. It says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, 
ye know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So once again, the, the Holy Spirit or God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So we see that Peter was the one who was appointed to speak to the Gentiles. We're going to further prove this later on when we go to the gospel of the Holy 12, and we're going to hear it from the Savior's mouth himself. But I want to also go here. Like I said, I wasn't planning on going here, so I just need to find this real quick. All right, Galatians 2. So I found what I was looking for. It's in Galatians 2 chapter or verse 6. I want you to read, I want you to listen to this. It says, and this is Paul talking. It says, but of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepted no man's persons. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Now, this might sound confusing to you because it's in the old English uh, type of writing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a different translation so you can understand even further. Actually, we're going to look at two translations. We're going to go to the message and look at this one first. Verse six, it says, as for those who were considered important in the church, their reputation doesn't concern me. So he was talking about James and Peter. God isn't impressed with mere appearances and neither am I. And of course, these leaders were able to add nothing to the message I had been preaching. I don't know if anybody's picking up this attitude from Paul, but I definitely am. So we're going to keep reading. It says it was soon evident that God had entrusted me with the same message to the non-Jews, that's the Gentiles, as Peter had been preaching to the Jews. Let's read it in the NIV. Let's go to the NIV. Verse six, it says, as for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. It's funny. He says he doesn't show favoritism, even though he did show favoritism toward Peter and made him Petra, the rock upon which the church was going to be built. So it's, it's funny that Paul says that, but he says, God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, that is Jews. So we see here that Paul is saying he is called to preach to the Gentiles and Peter is called to preach to the Jews. Now, the reason I'm going there and the reason I've, I haven't even started this lesson, but the reason I'm going there, because I want to go back to Acts 15, where we hear from the mouth of Peter himself. Verse seven says, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago. So people knew this. God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And the reason, I'm going to show you this, the reason why he even had to say that, because verse seven says, and when there had been much disputing, but what were they disputing about? Who, who was causing these disputes? Let's go to verse one. 
And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So we see here this whole thing started with the Jews coming to Paul and Barnabas and saying that if you weren't circumcised, you can't be saved. But when you scroll down, who was the ones that were in charge? Verse four says, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse six says, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. Now, when we get to verse seven, it said, Peter rose up and said unto them, who was the person that was in charge? The only one that can be in charge is the one that's rising up. That's Peter. So Peter would know because one, Peter was the rock of the church. So he's at, he's operating in his authority as being the rock of the church, the small rock which the Savior said he was going to be in, the church was going to be built on him. So Peter rose up as being the leader. Then he solidifies what the Savior said and says, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So right here, we have to figure out whose report are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the report of Peter or are we going to believe the report of Paul? Once again, this message is called Simon Magus. We haven't even started talking about Simon Magus, but the Holy Spirit wanted me to go here first before I did anything else. This was completely off the script. I just wanted to point that part out. Let's go back to the Clementine of homilies. So we're back over here. Let's start reading here again. And. And this I know, not as being a prophet, but as already seen the beginning of this very evil. For some from among the Gentiles have rejected my legal preaching, attaching themselves to certain lawless and trifling preaching of the man who is my enemy. Now, notice at the end of that enemy, it says 890. If you scroll at the bottom or look at the bottom, it says 890. Uh, in brackets, it says, this is one of the strongest anti-Pauline insinu uh, insin insinuations in the entire literature. So how is Simon Magus connected with Paul? We're going to find out in a second. We're going to keep reading this part. It says, uh, let's start right after right there. And, and these things some have attempted while I am still alive to transform my words by certain various interpretations. Once again, to transform my words by certain various interpretations in order to the dissolution of the law. That word dissolution. Let's see. Let's see what dissolution is. Uh, I just want dissolution. Let's see. Dissolution. Let's see if we can. Uh, let's just look it up. Dissolution. We're going to go to the dictionary. Dissolution. Right here. definition. So dissolution, if you read it, it says the closing down or dismissal of an assembly, partnership, or official body. A uh, similar, it says secession, conclusion, end, ending, finish, termination. 
So remember these words. Remember the words like termination, finished, uh, ending in. And let's go back to over here. Uh, actually, let's start right here. Uh, while some have attempted, while I am still alive to transform my words by certain various interpretations in order to the ending. Remember, I say, remember the word ending. Let's see. In order to the ending. Uh, where is it at? Dissolution. Ending. The termination. The conclusion. The finishing. So those words. In order to the ending termination of the law. Now, it's funny. Think about who preached of the ending, the termination, like termination is, is gone. The conclusion, like it's, it's done away with who preached against the law. I don't have to make anything up. We can go right to the New Testament and read it right from the words of Paul. Remember, he said the law was a school teacher, but we don't we're no longer under the school teacher. Well, if we're no un, longer under the school teacher, he's saying we're no longer under the law. But see, there is always a law. There's always an eternal law. But let's get to reading. It says in in order to the dissolution of the law, as though I also myself were of a such mind. But did not freely proclaim it, which God forbid. For such a thing were to act in opposition to the law of God, which was spoken by Moses, and was borne witness to by our Lord in respect of its eternal continuance. Once again, eternal continuance. For thus he spoke, the heavens and the earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. He, now he's quoting right here from the Savior himself. Peter is quoting from the Savior himself, which makes me want to go to a scripture in, let's see, it's in Exodus, Exodus 31. Let's go to Exodus 31. Verse 15, this is one of those laws. Exodus 31, 15 says, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord or Yahweh. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual. I want to click on that word perpetual. So you can see what perpetual is. Perpetual. Let's just start clicking right here. Forever. Uh, let's see. Everlasting. So it's forever. This is a everlasting law. I like this word too. Eternal. See, it, this can't be done away with. He said it's perpetual. Here's what I want to do. Let me put in this word. Sabbath. Scroll all the way down right here. Colossians chapter two, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Which are, verse 17, which are a shadow. He said, these are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. The body, let's see. The substance is of Christ. But it's funny because Christ told us to keep the law, not to break it. That not one jot or tittle shall end wise from the law pass. And he told you whose law it was. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said, if you love the father, you'll keep his commandments. Well, we know the father came down and literally wrote the commandments on tablets of stone. that were eternal, perpetual. 
But here we have someone saying, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Let's go back and let's get the reading from the words of Peter. So we're going to start right here. It says, the heavens and the earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise from or in no wise pass from the law. And this he has said that all things might come to pass. But these men, listen, listen again. But these men, not man, not this man, these men, meaning it was more than one person. It said, but these men professing, I know not how. So this was confusion to Peter. He said, I don't know how to know my mind, undertake to explain my words, which they have heard of me, which they have heard of me. Once again, which they have heard of me more intelligently than I who spoke them. So there was somebody, there were some men who were taking the words of Peter and making his words in their mind more intelligent, more intelligently uh, spoken than him. Now, I'm going to go to let's I'm going I'm once again, I'm just going off cuff because the Holy Spirit is having me go here. So we see once again, it said these men professing that know not how to know my mind undertake to explain my words, which they have heard of me. I want to pause right here and we're going to go to the gospel of the Holy 12 and read the prophecy that Hamashiach gave to Peter. Let's go there now. All right, we're in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, and we're going to start, let me see, actually, I was going to start at one place. Let's start, actually, at verse six. Let's start right here. It said, this is now the sixth time that Jesus, Yahawashi, Yeshua, showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus, Yahuwah, Yahshua, I'll just use Yeshua, said to Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Yeshua said unto him, feed my flock. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, thou art a rock from the rock. And on this rock, Will I build my church? Let's pause right there. Who was he building the church on? He said, Peter was a rock from the rock. And on this rock, on Peter, Petra, he was building his church, not on Paul. The church was going to be built on Peter. And it says, and I will raise thee above my 12 to be my vicegerent, meaning representative upon earth for a century of unity to the 12. Listen, and another shall be called and chosen to fill thy place among the 12. And thou shalt be the servant of servants and shall feed my rams. Now it's funny. This time he said rams. He said he was going to feed his rams. Those are Gentiles. He calls the Gentiles rams, my sheep and my lambs. So the father, or excuse me, the savior right here said, who was the rock of the church? Who was going to be the one who feeds his sheep, his lambs, and his rams, the Gentiles. So the, what Peter said was 100% true when he said, you know of a time 
that he called me to be the uh, mouthpiece for the Gentiles. Out of my mouth, the Gentiles would receive salvation. Right here is confirmed through the mouth of the Savior. But let's get to the prophecy of Paul. It says, verse 9, and yet another shall arise and he shall teach many things which I have taught you already. Taught Peter already. So we hear Peter. Remember, we just got to reading Peter, how he was frustrated that there were some men who are taking his teachings and acting as though they knew better and were more intelligent than he was. So once again, verse nine says, and yet another shall arise and he shall teach many things which I have taught you already. And he shall spread the gospel among the Gentiles with great zeal. We know who he's talking about. But the keys of the kingdom Will I give to those who succeed thee in my spirit? Who succeed who? Peter or Paul? Peter. It says, give to those who succeed thee, Peter, in my spirit and obeying what? My law. Now let's go back to the Clementine of homilies. All right. We're going to start right here at the Clementine of homilies at but. Once again, it says, but these men professing, I know not how to know my mind, undertake to explain my words, which they have heard of me more intelligently than I who spoke them, telling their catechisms or catechumens, excuse me, that this is my meaning, which indeed I never thought of. But if while I am still alive, they dare thus to misrepresent me. How much more will those who shall come after me dare to do so? <sighs> wow. So we see that Peter is having a, a, a fit about these people changing his teachings and then acting as though they have a higher uh, level and understand more then he who had been with the Savior, spent time with the Savior, spent personal time with the Savior and was taught by him. We're going to go ahead and do a Google search. Let's go. Let's go there now. Let's do this Google search. And here's what I want to put in. Uh, let's see here. The man. who was Apostle, uh, let me get that space in there. Apostle Peter's enemy. Let's look this up. So the man who was Apostle Peter's enemy Right here, Simon Magnus. It says the act of simony or paying for position. His name is named after Simon, who tried to buy his way into the power of the apostles. According to Acts, Simon was a Samaritan, Magus, or religious figure of the first century AD. Now, I want you to pay attention. It says Simon was a Samaritan, Magus, or religious figure. So he was a religious figure figure of the first century. See, in the King James, it only tells us about him being a sorcerer, being a witch. But here it says that he was a religious figure as well, as well as he was a, a, a sorcerer, Simon the magician. He was a magician, but he was also a religious figure of the first century AD and a convert to Christianity, baptized by Philip the evangelist. Simon later clashed with Peter. So this is the enemy of um, Peter. Now, of course, there is a saying going around that Simon Magus is the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul is Simon Magnus. They are one in the same. I personally don't believe that 
Uh, there's not much proof on it. Um, it might be true. I I don't know. I don't want to make a false accusation against uh, uh against Paul saying that Simon Magus is Paul because there's no clear cut um there's is there's no clear cut road to it. There's no scriptures that point out that Simon Magus is in fact Paul. What I want to do though is show you some similarities between Simon Magus and Paul that's going to raise a red flag and that you should be aware of if you're going to read the writings of Paul. Now, now me, I'll never tell you not to read the writings of Paul. You always use the Holy Spirit. There are some things, and we're going to go over that too. There are many things that Paul said that was from the Holy Spirit. I'm going to prove it. One, actually, I already proved it because he said, uh, it, I don't even need to go back to this. If In the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, he said, he was going to have a zeal for the Gentiles and teach many things that I taught you already. So we know for a fact that there were things that Paul taught that are going to be true because he learned it from who? Peter. So it can't be everything he says cannot be a lie. But once again, the Savior said, but those who will get the kingdom will be those who follow Peter and obeying the law. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Acts. We're going to read about this Simon and un get a, a better understanding. I'm going to just scroll over here and get a better understanding of who Simon Magus really is. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter eight. We're going to start right at the beginning. Look at what it says right here. And Saul, and you're probably wondering, why am I reading about Saul right now? You'll, you'll understand. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. So we see Saul killing Stephen and making havoc of the church. It says, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Verse five, it says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But cert but there was a certain man called Simon. Now, the reason I read the first part about Paul is because the only place that you is it, is interesting. And I do understand why people believe that Simon Magus is Paul, because Here's the introduction of Paul in Acts chapter eight, when his name is Saul, persecuting the church, killing them, you know, killing uh, Stephen, making havoc of them. Then all of a sudden you get to verse five. We see Philip go to Samaria because he like, man, this is jacked up. He goes there, starts preaching and great joy in the city. Then all of a sudden in the same exact chapter, during the same exact time, we get the introduction of who Simon is. So I can understand why people believe that Simon uh, Magus is, in fact, Saul. I do understand when you read this because it's like, how it, it seems like these two people are intertwined right in the same chapter. But, but once again, I don't go off of um, just he say, she say, not without evidence. So I'm going to leave that alone. I told you there's certain things, I'll put it on the shelf. That I'll put on the shelf, but I just want to point out something else. Verse nine, once again, it says, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So he thought that he was a great one and, and above everyone else, above the apostles. Once again, above the apostles. He thought that he was above all the apostles. 
Did not we read the same thing with Paul who said, I, I conferred not with them. I no, I'm they, they're not special. Did not he say that out of his own mouth? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 10, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him, they had regard because that of long time, he had bewitched them with sorcery. So we see uh, Simon using his magic skills to bewitch people. Verse 12 says, but when they believe Philip preaching the things, uh, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ or the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, they were baptized both men and women. Verse 13 says, then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So what, uh, what, um, how should I say it? What amazed him that that wonder were amazed. That's what I was trying to trying to think of. What amazed Simon was was that he saw someone healing people at a greater intensity than he was. Simon was using magic and sorcery. Uh, Philip was healing through the Holy Spirit and and getting people healed. So he's amazed at him. So we know that his his so called conversion was not um, authentic. If you know the whole uh, story of Simon Magus, his ending did not end well. Verse 14. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So now enters Peter into the fray. So now we got in this same chapter, we got Saul, the persecutor of the Jews. We got Simon, the witch, the, the witch and and uh, holy man, supposedly holy man, and, and the great one that everybody called the great one, greater than the apostles. Then we have the introduction of Peter. Verse 15, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, remember, this event happened after the um, Pentecost. So, they never seen they never seen the Holy Ghost fall or anything like that. Peter come, Peter and, and, and John come, and now we have the Holy Spirit coming on the scene, speaking in tongues. So let's read for uh, 15. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy uh, Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus or Yahawashai. Verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. This is where the introduction of simony came from because he believed that he could purchase the power of God through commerce or through money, through mammon. Verse 20, but Peter said unto him, thy money, thy mammon perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. I'm going to pause for the calls on this one. If you are in a church where you have to pay for a prophecy, where you have to pay for a word to be spoken until you get out of that church, right here, Peter is telling you, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. If a, 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 a so-called prophet or a prophetess or anyone who is doing that and making you purchase, making you pay for a prophecy, woe be unto them. But woe be unto you if you stay under that. Verse 21, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So here's where the beef starts. So I'm just, I'm just trying to put this in regular terms. This is where the beef starts. So he telling, he telling Simon, dude, your heart ain't right. You you trying to buy the gift of, of the most high with money? Dude, you need to correct yourself. 
look at this. Verse 22, repent therefore of this wickedness. So he called Simon. It, he was like, what you just did was wickedness. Simony is wickedness. If somebody does simony, it's wickedness. If they trying to get the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of God from uh, money through, through exchange, wickedness. Repent, therefore, of this of this thy wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come unto me or come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of, of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So once again, we see this was the introduction of not only Saul, but the introduction of Simon and the introduction of Simon meeting Peter. So the reason I read that is because there are some very eerie similarities, once again, uh, to Paul and Simon Magus. I'm going to point out a few from the Clement time of homilies. So we're going to do this and I'm just going to tell you. So number one, someone was speaking words contrary to Peter and James teaching. We read that part. And actually, let's just go back to it. Let's just let's just go back just for one second. Uh, let's go right to this part. We don't have to read the whole thing. We're just going to write, go right here for right there for some from among the Gentiles have rejected my legal preaching, attaching themselves to certain lawless and trifling preaching of the man who is my enemy. Once again, I said, it says 890 and it says at the bottom, this is one of the strongest anti-Pauline insinuations in the entire literature. They attach this to him talking about Paul. And they it says that they attempted this while he was alive. So I don't want to go over the whole thing because we just got there going over this, but there were people who were taking Peter's words, twisting them, making their own doctrine. And boy, wait till you see some of the scriptures I'm going to show you about Paul. Number two, it says, uh, Peter says not to believe the testimony of one person, but to believe those who walk with the Messiah. Now, before I even go to what Peter said about this, here's what I want to do. I want to go to the words of the Messiah himself. Let's see. Matthew chapter 18 Verse 16. Actually, let's read 15. It says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Listen to this. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. He always dealt with two or three witnesses when it came to the word that came out of people's mouths. That's the reason why he had 12 apostles. That's the reason why the prophets of old talked about the Messiah before he even came. That's why they even prophesied about John coming before him, being his predecessor. That's the reason why John, when John was here on the earth, set up the scene for the Messiah to come because if the Messiah would have came without there being any type of prophecy, any type of witness, remember actually even Moses spoke and said that there was going to be one greater than him that was going to come out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. That's why they were waiting for the Messiah because it came out of the mouth of two or three of the prophets of old. And the uh, John the Baptist, who was who was the forerunner, who set up the whole scene for the Savior to come. So we know the importance of two or three witnesses. 
that is the order of the most high. That is the order that even the son of man, Yeshua, Jesus, Yahuasha, Yahushua, same thing he said. Now, let's go to the Clement time of homilies and let's see what Peter said. This is going to be found in chapter 19. Let me see. Chapter 19, uh, 14. Let's see. I think I'm here. Let's see. Right here. This is what I want to read. Pay attention to this. This is. This is important. This section is called opposition to Peter unreasonable. Listen to what he said. Now, remember, this is I'm um, we're talking about Simon Magnus, but that we're talking about some similarities between Simon Magnus and the Apostle Paul. It says, if then our Jesus appeared to you in a vision. Now, this is when he was talking to Simon Magnus. He said, if he appeared to you in a vision. Who else did the Savior appear to in a vision? Or he saw a light and said, it's hard for thee if thou prick us against the stone. That was Paul. So let's read Peter's word. He says, if then our Jesus or Yeshua appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you. It was as one who is, listen to this. It was as one who is enraged with an adversary. And this is the reason why it was through visions and dreams or through revelation. Ooh, I'm a, I'm a pause. I'm going to prove that he's, that he's telling the truth. It says it was as one who is enraged with an adversary. And that is the reason why it was through visions and dreams. I'm, I, the Holy spirit just gave me something. Hold on for a second. Let me see if I can find this. Um, let me see if I can find this. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to find the part where, uh, speak. Let me see. I can find it. Dark. There it is. This is what I was looking for. Numbers 12. Now I'm just I'm going to scroll back over here for one second and read this again. Opposition to Peter unreasonable. It says, if then our Jesus appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you. It was as one who is enraged with an adversary. And this is the reason why it was through visions and dreams or through revelations that were from without that he spoke to you. I'm going to go over here to Numbers chapter 12 and read the account of Moses. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Listen, Numbers 12, let's start at verse. Actually, should I have started at? Let's start at verse. Uh, I'm going to start at verse three. It says, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud. And stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. Now, remember what Peter just said. Verse six, it says, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him. Listen, in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Let me go back here. Opposition to Peter unreasonable. If then our Jesus appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you, it was as one who is enraged with an adversary. And this is the reason why it was through visions 
and dreams or through revelations that were from without that he spoke to you. Going back, verse six, Numbers 12, six. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Mm, Line upon line, precept upon precept right there. Verse seven, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in mine, all mine house. I'm gonna read that again. My servant, the apostle Peter, is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. See, like the Savior did when he came and spoke to Peter mouth to mouth. Even apparently and not in dark. Let me show you what that word dark. Dark saying or riddles in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, when were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. Let me read that one more time. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant, Apostle Paul, the rock of the church? We know how this scenario played out, but see, they spoke against his servant. I'm going to show you another one who spoke against his servant. Let's see. Right here. Galatians chapter two, verse 11. This is Paul talking. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him. Listen, I opposed him. I stood against him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, it's funny when you read this whole thing. It just it doesn't match up because it's like he just goes off on Peter, accuses him, just ridicules him. And then Peter says nothing. Everything's good. And Paul just keeps going on preaching. Something about this story is completely wrong. Just read this Galatians chapter two, verse 11. Read it down and you're going to understand. But let's go back to this again. (laughs) Opposition to Peter unreasonable. If then our Jesus appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you, it was as one who is enraged with an adversary. And this is the reason why it was through visions and dreams or through revelations that were from without that he spoke to you. But can anyone be rendered fit for instruction through apparitions? Let me look up that word, apparitions. I don't even know what that means. Apparitions. Let's see. Apparitions. Let's see. Apparition definition. Oh, through a ghost or ghost-like image of a person. Oh, through visions, hallucinations. Okay. Phantom, ghost. Oh, okay. That's what an apparition is. So when he's saying right here, I'll start right here. But can anyone be rendered fit for instruction through spirits, through hallucinations or what you call a vision? And if you will say it is possible, then I ask, listen to this. Why did our teacher abide and discourse a whole year To those who were awake. Something to think about. See, after the Savior rose, he kept teaching his apostles and gave them greater knowledge, gave them greater wisdom and understanding of the word before he left. And this is what Peter said. He said, why did our teacher then abide and discourse a whole year to those who were awake? And how are we to believe? This is what I was trying to get to. And how are we to believe your word, Simon? Or in this in this point, I'm going to say Paul, because here's where the similarities come, because he's talking to Simon. But listen to what he's saying. And how are we to believe your word 
when you tell us that he appeared to you. Remember the, the um, account of Paul, there's three different accounts. All of them are different. But it only comes through the mouth of Paul. So we have to believe Paul's account on his conversion story. But it's only one witness. And we see here that uh, Paul or excuse me, Peter is having a problem with Simon. He's like, and how are we to believe your word when you tell us that he appeared to you? So, you know, if he had a problem with Simon's conversion story and that he uh, the spirit appeared unto him, that God appeared to him. Then he also had a problem with Paul when Paul told his story and that he appeared to him. He didn't all of a sudden say, no, I don't believe you, Simon, but Paul, uh, you you cool. I believe your conversion story 100%. I'm going I'm to read again. It says once again right here. And, and how are we to believe your word when you tell us that he appeared to you? And how did he appear to you? When you entertain opinions contrary to his teachings. Does Paul or does Paul not say that the law is done away with? Does he say that it's grace that saves? Does he not say that? Does the Savior say that you're going to be judged according to your works? Your works, your works, your works. Men are going to be judged according to their works. They'll be saved by their works, judged according to their works. Doesn't the Savior say that not only through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but also in Revelation, the last book, when he says he's, he calls us all small, great, little, big, all of them to come. He's going to open a book and judge them according to their works. Their works are written down in a book. Then his brother, James, even, even, even comes even harder. And I think James was really coming against Paul because he said, you can't, you can't separate faith and works. Somebody didn't tell that to Paul because according to Paul, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the Savior said it is works and you do have to do works. And he even tells you to work while it is day. Ah, let's get the reading right here. But. But if you were seen and taught by him and became his apostle, listen, but if you were seen and taught by him, like I, like, like I, Peter was and became his apostle for a single hour, proclaim his utterances, the things that he said, interpret his sayings, the sayings that he said, love, ooh, love his apostles. Love his apostles. This was something that Paul had a problem with. Love his apostles. I'm going to prove it. Contend not with me who companied with him. Did I not? Con, listen, contend not with me who comp, accompanied him. Contend. Let's, let's look up that word contend. Let's see if I can do it from here. Contend. Dictionary. Contend. Compete, challenge, contest, strive, struggle, tussle, grapple, wrestle, scuffle, squabble, skirmish, battle, combat, wage, war. I mean, listen to what it says. Oppose, 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 oppose. Oh, yeah, oppose. Let's go back. Let's go back. Oppose. Oppose right here. Listen, verse 11 again, Galatians 2, 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood, opposed. What do we just read over here? Uh, where are we at? Over here. When it says his apostles contend. What do we just get through reading about that word contend? And we clicked on the dictionary. And that word oppose was right here. Oppose that word right there. That means contend, oppose. But we got Paul doing what over here. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood 
I opposed him to the face because he was to be blamed. But we got over here. I'm going to start right here. But if you were seen and taught by him and became his apostle for a single hour, proclaim his utterances, interpret his sayings, love his apostles, contend or oppose not Paul with me who accompanied him. I was with him for in direct opposition to me. Let's see who am a firm rock, the foundation of the church. Now you now stand. See, we had Simon doing the exact same thing as Paul did, opposing Apostle Peter and feeling justified in doing it. Let's get to reading. It says, if you were not opposed to me, you would not accuse me, Paul or Simon, both of them, and revile the truth proclaimed by me in order that I may not be believed because what would happen? What do you think happened when Peter or excuse me, when Paul accused or opposed Peter to the face because he was to be blamed? The people who were around Paul stopped believing in the teachings of Peter and start following Paul because Paul opposed him accused him, which made Peter look smaller, weaker, and made Paul look greater, more intelligent, more sophisticated, more supreme. Whew. Wow. If we're going to start right here. If you were not opposed to me, you would not accuse me and revile the truth pro uh, proclaimed by me in order that I may not be believed when I state what I myself have heard with mine own ears from the Lord. As if I were evidently a person that was condemned in a bad repute. But if you say that I am condemned because Paul did condemn he he condemned him and so did Simon. It says but if you say that I am condemned you bring an accusation against God who revealed the Christ to me. And you inveigh against him who pronounced me blessed on account of the revelation. See, the savior accounted Peter blessed on a revelation. I'm I'm going to pause again. Ah, let's go to Gates Hill. Right here, Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 15. It says, he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus, Yeshua, said, answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for blessed or for flesh and blood have not revealed revelation. There's your revelation. For flesh and blood have not given you this revelation or revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So there's the revelation right now. The first revelation going to Peter. Then let's continue. It says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Who did he give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to? To Peter, Apostle Peter. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we see right here, we see the Savior telling Peter, revelation was given to you by the Father. The reward for that is you're going to be the rock where the church is going to be built. The gates of hell aren't going to prevail against you. And actually, I'm going to even give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind and whatever you lose is going to be bound and loose. So then we go to the word revelation. And once again, I'm just this is just flowing right now. The Holy Spirit is flowing. And I want you to see how Paul uses 
the word revelation. Let me see. Where is it at? Oh, I don't even know if I want to go there yet, but I'm going to read this because I'll go here again. Romans 16, verse 25, it says, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. See, the keys of the kingdom was given to Peter. But now there's this other gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret from since the beginning of the world or since the world began. Let me read another one. This is. Um, here's another one I want to read. Uh This is what I want to go. Here it is. This was it. Now, remember about this whole boasting thing. Galatians 1 verse 11, it says, but I certify, I certify, I, I, let's see what that word certify is. I, I make it known, you brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, of him, is not after man. See, he's going to, listen. I can't make this stuff up. This is from Paul's mouth. It's not of man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the, what? Revelation. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation. Revelation. So he didn't go to the apostles. He didn't, he didn't go to the Savior. None of that. He went by revelation. He says... It was by revelation. Y'all know where I'm going. I'm going right back. I'm matter of fact, I'm scrolling back. I'm going right back here. If, if then our Jesus, Yeshua appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you. It was as one who is enraged with an adversary. And this is the reason why it was through visions and dreams or through revelations that were from without. Once again, through visions, dreams, or through revelations that were from without that he spoke to you. But can anyone be rendered fit for instruction through apparitions, through dreams, or through visions, or through a spirit? Let's get to reading this. <sighs> yeah, let's, let's start right here. But but if you say that I am condemned, you bring an accusation against God who revealed the Christ to me. I just got to reading that. And you inveigh against him who pronounced me blessed on account of the revelation. But if indeed you really wish to work in the cause of truth, listen, learn first of all from us. See, Paul did not want to learn from the apostles. He wanted to learn from Revelation and then boast about how he did not confer with any of the apostles. It says, learn first of all from us what we have learned from him and become a disciple of the truth. Become a fellow worker with us. That whole that was loaded right there from what uh, the apostle Peter said. And that was, I mean, that was incredible what he said. Now, we're going to go to number three. And that was the prophecy that was mentioned in the gospel of the Holy Twelve about another who was coming. We read that already, but we're just going to go over it real quick. Let's go there now. All right, we're in lection or gospel of the Holy 12, lection 89, verse 9. We're going to start reading right there. Verse 9, it says, and yet another shall arise and he shall teach many things, which I have taught you, Peter, already. And he shall spread the gospel among the Gentiles with great zeal. So here's the thing, because most people think that Paul wasn't sent by the Savior. He was sent by the Savior. 
but he spoke to him in dreams, visions, and revelations while he spoke to Peter face to face. Same thing with uh, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. See, he spoke to Moses face to face. He spoke to Miriam and Aaron through dreams, visions, revelations, but not Moses because he spoke to, he was precious to him. He spoke to him face to face. Peter was precious to the most high. That's why he made him the rock and spoke to him face to face. Not like, not like uh, Paul, who he spoke only through visions, dreams, revelations, so this, once again, verse nine, and yet another shall rise and he shall teach many things which I have taught you already. And he shall spread the gospel among the Gentiles with great zeal. But the keys of the kingdom, see, I want to know what the keys of the kingdom are. And if someone doesn't have the keys of the kingdom, I'm only going to listen to the things that they teach that was from the people who know what the keys of the kingdom are. That's the reason I said, don't throw everything uh, out that Paul says, because we know how they manipulated this King James Bible. We know how there is only two books of Peter in here. So we have to go to some of Paul's writings in order to understand and know some of the things that Peter spoke and some of the things that even the Messiah spoke. Like for instance, in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, you can find what's in Paul's writings. Uh, though I, let's see, with Paul it says, uh, "Do I speak with the tongues of men and such as and have not charity? It's nothing." Y'all know that one? Well, that's in, that's what the Savior actually said. It's in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. And he talked about it, said it more elaborate. It's also in the Clementine of Homilies because it came out of the mouth of Peter as well because he learned from the Savior. But what did they do? They removed it and gave it to Paul. So that's why some things I'll, I will quote Paul uh, from Paul because it's in the King James. And some people, for some odd reason, well, only accept the King James Bible. But we're, uh, listen, we're in the day and age. Y'all got to stop being just fooled by the King James. There are many things missing out of it and many editings of the King James. It's just, just as well as some, some of the other texts. But people think that the King James is the all in all, the most perfect book, and it's not. And the Savior even says that. So, But we have to use the words of Paul and we use them by the spirit and out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. If we can't find two or three witnesses, we put it to the side. We don't listen to it. And we always, 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 one thing I will always tell you, go to and listen to the voice of the Savior. He says, my sheep hear my voice and the voice of another they won't follow. If the words of anyone doesn't line up with his words, I won't listen to it. I only hear the voice of my savior, my doorway. Some people call him Jesus. I call him Yahawashai. Some people call him Yeshua, Yahushua. That man, that's the one I listen to because I can't put my money on anything else but his salvation. So we just read here once again, and yet another shall arise and he shall teach many things which I have taught you already. And he shall spread the gospel among the Gentiles with great zeal, but the keys of the kingdom Will I give to those who succeed thee in my spirit and obeying my law? Last one. And this is number four. Paul is mentioned in the sealed portion. Remember, I've started teaching from the sealed portion, uh, the final testament of Jesus Christ that has been sealed. Well, Paul is actually mentioned in there and it mentions that he's not being completely truthful. And we're going to go to it. Let's go to it right now. All right. We're in the sealed portion, the final Testament of Jesus Christ. And this is uh, chapter 39. We're going to start at verse 62. Look at what it says here. It says, and now my beloved brethren, yea, even those of you who have put yourselves up as prophets and apostles, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to just read it the way that it says it. And apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, repent ye and come unto the Lord. Preach unto the people the words of Christ. Once again, preach unto the people the words of Christ. What did I just say? I just said, listen to his words, his sheep hear his voice. It's telling you right here, confirming that preach unto the people the words of Christ. 
which are already among you and which shall be given unto you in this record. Embrace these words and cause the world to rejoice in that which the father have done to redeem all of his children. Yea, be a friend of Christ and not his enemy. Wow. Isn't that what Peter said too? He said he, he speaks through dreams, visions, and revelations because you're an enemy. Wow. It's amazing that here, precept upon precept right here. Verse 64. And now I have said these things unto you that ye might know further concerning the manner of men that the Lord calleth to serve him as apostles and prophets. This is important. Now, you have to listen to this. For in their youth, they are tried and tested by and through all the follies and experiences of youth. Uh, wow. Verse 65. And in many instances, they do err and keep not the commandments of God in all things and run contrary to the spirit that have been given unto them to prepare them for the work which they have been foreordained to do. Now, if you think about the life of Paul, just look at the scriptures right here and how it says they do err and keep not the commandments of God in all things and run contrary. That's the life of Paul and Simon, because we're talking about Simon Magus but we're given similarities from Simon Magus to Paul. They both did the exact same thing. They ran contrary. They were leading people away from the Savior. Verse 66, for by their experiences, they shall have a greater understanding of that which they shall preach unto the people. For how can a man, let me scroll over here, how can a man among you yeah, let's make it bigger. How can a man among you preach concerning that which ye should do when he hath not done that thing which he expected of you? In other words, how can he know for a surety that that which he requireth of you is that which he knoweth shall bring you happiness? If it so be that he have not experienced the opposite of this happiness himself. So Paul was a persecutor of the church. Simon was a persecutor, uh, get, showing people witchcraft. Actually, he was doing he was doing some crazy stuff. If you read the account of Simon, Simon was uh, putting curses on people. They were dying. They all all kind of crazy stuff. But. What this is saying right here, like it says, in other words, how can he know for a surety that that which he required of you is that which he knoweth shall bring you happiness if it so be that he hath not experienced the opposite. So we saw Paul as the persecutor of the church. We saw we see Simon as the persecutor of um, Samaria, of, of the Gentiles, putting them into bondage through witchcraft and sorcery. They couldn't experience the happiness of preaching the word if they did not experience the opposite of that, the persecuting of the saints. Verse 67, it says, and for this reason, all the prophets and apostles of the Lord shall be refined and taught in their youth that they may be more fully prepared for that which they have been called to do. I'm pausing because you even got to think of, of Peter in this instance. Peter said, I'll never deny you. Peter denied him three times, caught crow. Savior looked at him and was like, dude, Peter went off. Ah, just, I mean, just boohooing. But from that refinement, we have the strong apostle Peter who represented the Savior after that. I mean, hard. He went hard for him after that. That's the refinement that he had to go through. Same with Paul. There was a refinement that he had to go through. He was the persecutor of the Jews, killed Stephen. Then after that, his encounter with the Most High. Once again, not the same as Peter, 
He spoke, he, he showed him through a vision, through dream, through revelation, not the same as Peter, but on his level. So once again, right here, it says, and this refinement shall cause many of you to look at them as sinners. We look at Paul as sinners. Now I did a message called judge not. And I'm telling you, this is why I uh, am changing my stance because the level of judgment that we have for a person is the same level that we're going to get. But you, I still have to tell the truth and I still have to show the scripture. But what one thing that we can't do, because I see sometimes in the comments, Paul is going to hell. He's the child of the devil, such, such, such. We don't know that. That's, that is, that's just our opinion. We don't know that. Did he lie? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Did did Peter lie? Yes, he did. See, I'm bringing both in because you you can't take one lie and and not acknowledge the other. Peter lied when they said it's like, hey, weren't you with him? No, I wasn't with him. Hey, I, I'm sure I saw you. No, nigga, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sure, man. Blankety blank, 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 blank. You see what I'm saying? Right there, they lied. Both lied. But what we do is we, um exalt one lie above the other and look at the other one. Oh, it wasn't a big thing. It was a, a lie is a lie is a lie. Once again, it says, and this refinement shall cause many of you to look at them as sinners for as such view them, the Jews who witnessed the types of men that Jesus had called or Yeshua had called. 68, nevertheless, nevertheless, except in a few instances, Shall any of these men who have been called of God do unto others that which they would not have done unto them? For this is the essence of their spirits. And it is also the essence of all the true commandments of God. He's saying, look, don't he said do unto others that which they would not have done unto them. So in a few instances, shall any of these men who have been called of God do unto others that which they would not have done unto them, for this is the essence of their spirits. And it is also the essence of all the true commandments of God. But those who pass through the fire, see, this is what it is, the fires of refinement. That seems like a whole message I can do, the fire of refinement. But those who pass through the fires of refinement shall know of their sins. Peter immediately knew of his sin that he did. He passed through the fire of refinement. It said, but those who pass through the fires of refinement shall know of their sins and these sins shall cause them immediately or immediate unhappiness. So we saw that that happened when he, when the cock crowed three times and immediately he knew that he betrayed the savior. His, his ace boom coon betrayed the savior. And those who do not pass through this fire receive no such unhappiness from the sins that they do. And because most do not experience immediate unhappiness in their sins, they begin to justify their actions as righteousness. And this because of their pride. This goes on a lot in, in church. They'll do different things. And I hate just keep uh, going to the church, but just in people general, let's just put it like that. It said those who do not pass through this fire receive no such unhappiness because they're, see they're seeing the fruits of the reward of this world. So they feel that the rewards of this world is the happiness that the most high wants them to have. So they don't repent because they don't experience that immediate unhappiness even in their sins. And then they begin to justify how it says right here. They begin to justify their actions, what they do. We know that with the government and different things like that, they justify their actions because they're living in nice houses. They can tell people what to do. They can throw people out their homes. They can put people in jail unrighteously, but because they don't see immediate, un immediate um, unhappiness because of their sins, they begin to justify their actions as righteousness. And this because of their pride. Ah, verse 70. Nevertheless, in the end shall all experience the punishment of their sins. 
but he who have passed through the fire of refinement shall acknowledge all of his sins and justify none. That was the reason why I did the message, uh, judge not the one, uh, that was before this one, because, and I, I guess sometimes like I just be preaching myself, but I don't care. We have to get out of the judgment zone and judging others and holding uh, others to this high standard when the most high makes it rain on the just and the unjust. And a lot of times we think that we're just, but as we're judging others, we become unjust because we're we're judging others according to a standard that we have set up instead of judging them according to the standard the Most High has set up. And the standard he set up said, judge not so you won't be judged. That's his standard. And it says for what level that you judge, that, that judgment is going to come on you. So verse 70 again, it says, nevertheless, in the end shall all experience the punishment of their sin, but he who hath passed through the fire of refinement shall acknowledge all of his sins and justify none. And all of the men who were called to be apostles to the Lord during the time of his ministry were refined men. See, they were all refined who have been through the refining fire of the spirit and have been prepared from the beginning. Verse 72 right here. And now it is not important to point out the various facts of the individual lives of these apostles. And if you knew of their lives as I know of them, then I would think that those among you who are wicked would misjudge them and concern yourselves more with your judgments of them than ye would with the message that were commanded to give unto the world. That's the reason why I'm, I, I did that message judge, not because I'm like, we're in a day and age right now where judgment is coming to the world. And it's not going to be us who judge. It's going to be the word of the most high. His word is going to judge. And what I want to do is concentrate not on judging others. I want to concentrate on giving out his message, his hope, to the world that Yeshua, Hamashiach, Yahawasha, Jesus, Yahushua, all of them, that he is the doorway and that his words, his commandments is the way, the truth and the life. And you can't come to the father except going through him and heeding to his voice. That's what I'm concentrating on. Verse 73, it says, nevertheless, here's where it gets, gets good. Nevertheless, there is one thing. So there is one thing. There is one thing right here. I'm just scrolling up. There is one thing that the spirit would have me write unto you concerning these apostles of the Lord. For I have seen that this thing hath been a source of much contention and misery among you of the latter days. And this contention hath been caused because ye do not understand the words of Christ, nor do ye have the spirit of Christ, which would keep you from becoming contentious with one another. Now I'm going to deal later on this whole issue, but I just want you to see this next two scriptures and we're going to stop here. 74 says, and now it is written among you in the words of a later apostle of Christ. Even he who was once called Saul. What? There is another prophecy about Paul. So who was once called Saul and who upon changing his life and repenting of his sins. See, he repented of his sins. He did repent of his sins, became known as Paul. Now, here's where we want to get to. Verse 75. We're going to stop right here. It says, and many of the words that ye have been given in the scriptures that ye accept as the words of God are the words of Paul. Once again, and many of the words that ye have been given in the scriptures that ye accept as the words of God are the words of Paul. And there are some of the words of Paul that were inspired of the Holy Ghost. 
Yea, even most of the words of Paul were so inspired. I told you before, I, I knew it by the spirit that I, I keep telling people. I tell my um, family members this all the time. 90% of what Paul said is actually true. It's just the 10%. And what you have to do is use the Holy Spirit to know what Paul taught that was his own words and what the Spirit taught. And it's almost easy to understand uh, some of the things that Paul said. And I, I and actually, I'm going to show you too. It says, once again, verse 35 says, and many of the words that ye have been given in scripture that ye accept as the words of God are the words of Paul. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. Um, let me go to uh, Romans 3, 5 through 7. Right here. This is Paul. This is not the most high. I'm telling you. Look at what he says. Verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? And he says right here, I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded, listen, through my lie unto his glory. I told you all, Paul, there are some things Paul said that he, it was his words and he lied about. He's telling you right here, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie. That's his words. I'm not making this up. Unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? This is right from his mouth. Right from his mouth. That's why you'll find sometimes, and let's go to uh, Romans. We'll stay in Romans, but go to 16. 25. That's why you hear sometimes he says this. It's Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. My gospel. Uh, actually, he says in uh, Romans 2, 16, I believe, too. Let me see. Yep. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, that's, well, that's ha partially true because he's going to judge them. And those who just did grace only and didn't do works, they, yeah, they're going to be in some trouble. They're going to be in some serious trouble who didn't do the works that, that, that followed the grace or the faith because it's faith and works. And those who only followed faith only, but did not the works. It's that's true. That he's going to judge the, the secrets of men. According to his gospel, that is very true. So I'm, I, I'll, I'll leave that as true. Let me read one more. The second Timothy. Let's see. Second Timothy two, verse eight. Another place he said it. Verse eight says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. According to my gospel. He tells you that he does have a gospel. And he. He clearly says it, that he didn't learn from the apostles and they didn't add anything to him. He learned by revelation. So how would you think that he was teaching the exact same things as the apostles of the of the most high, the apostles of the savior? How would he be teaching the exact same thing if he didn't learn from them, if he didn't learn firsthand from the savior? He wouldn't be. Ah. <sighs> I'm going to leave you with this last thing. And we're going to go to Peter. And this is how I look at um, Paul. Second Peter chapter three, verse 14. And this is a warning from Peter. It says, wherefore, right here, verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our, listen, even as our beloved brother, Paul. So that's what I call him. He's brother Paul. Some might call him apostle. I'm going to call him brother Paul. 
because I don't know about his apostleship. I can't can't say yay or nay, but I do see that my brother, my my apostle, the rock of the church, Peter, calls him Brother Paul. So I'm going to refer to him as Brother Paul. And I'll read it again. It says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. And also in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, of his of the wisdom that was given to him. Listen, in which are some things hard to be understood. So he was given warning right here that they're hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. See that word rest right here? They twist what he says. So those that are unlearned, that word unlearned, they're untaught and unstable. They twist the words. So they'll even twist the words because they'll twist the words of Paul and make it seem as though he said one thing. I've seen people do that. And I say, well, he didn't say that's not what he said. Some things he did say that were line upon line, precept upon precept. But you have the church. I hate to say it. You have Christians who twist his words, but they they would think that we're the ones who twist his words. But it's they who are twisting his words and it's going to lead to their destruction. A lot of prosperity uh, preachers use Paul's words to say that prosperity and wealth is theirs today. And that's what they concentrate on. Not even looking at the message of giving to others. I can go to Paul's writings and show you where he taught about uh, equality on how they were trying to do equality, which is what the Savior taught. Equality, which is what they were doing when um, they were given their houses and different things and they uh, split it up among the people so that everybody was equal and had all needs met. Equality. I'm going to do a lesson on that. So it says, once again, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. See, it's not just Paul's words that they twist. They twist the other scriptures to their demise. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall depart, uh, not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate unto a day and night that thou mayest observe to do all that is written in. So then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have thy uh, good success. Heard that in church all the time. What they concentrate on is thou make thy way prosperous and and how have good success. I'm going to have good success. I'm going to be prosperous. Joshua 1, 8. But it says this book of the law. Well, they don't follow the law. But the first words, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night and observe to do all that is written. See, that part gets skipped. And that's what it said right here. It says, as they do also right here, this part, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction, they'll twist any words that they can. Verse 17, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware. See, he's giving you, he's telling you to beware of Paul's words, not to not listen to any, anything he says, but beware. It says, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your steadfastness. Now, who let's let me just let me put the word steadfastness in steadfast. Ah, uh, let me see. Let me go right here, steadfastness. Uh, where is it at? Let's see if I can find it real quick. Oh, right here. Acts chapter two. Uh, let me see. Yeah, right here. See, here's the steadfastness that, that Peter was talking about. Acts chapter two, verse 38. We'll, we'll end with this. Then Peter said unto them, 
This is after after uh, Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, for the remission of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward, that word untoward, crooked generation. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They continually continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in Peter's doctrine, because he was the rock of the church. This message was about Simon Magus, also about Paul. And I wanted to show you the similarities between them so that you can make a sound decision, not only to continue to use the words of Paul, because I, I do believe that you still should use the scriptures because it says that he spoke much truth because a lot of the truth he got from the Savior, not directly, but through Peter. And a lot of the words are from Peter. But you also have to be aware of that leaven that's in there. So that's the thing you have to be aware. Of. Always do things line upon line, precept upon precept. If you're going to listen to his words, make sure that you do that. Like I said, I, I still use the words of Paul. I still use the scriptures of Paul because the scriptures clearly states that he did speak many things by the Holy Spirit. He did speak many things by uh, Peter that, that was taught of Peter or that he heard from Peter. But the keys of the kingdom are given to those that succeed Peter and obeying the law of the Savior. So once again, this message was Simon Magus. I hope that this information edified you. I hope that it gave you um, new information about not only Simon Magus, but who uh, Peter, or excuse me, who Paul was and the new scriptures that have been given. There's actually even more scriptures, but I just don't want this to be long, too long. It's already long, but I don't want it to be super, super long. So we'll pick up on it in another lesson. I um, hope that it edified and built you up. And until next time, hey, this is Christians Wake Up. With that said, I'm out.